Good evening. I hope everyone is doing well tonight. You know, I mentioned last Sunday, Ephesians uh, chapter 6 and verse 18, where we read about praying for all the saints. Uh, we do have many who are traveling at this time. There will be many who will be traveling, so uh, keep our fellow brothers and sisters in your thoughts as we pray. And also, when you pray, keep in mind uh, what was mentioned this morning, uh, the fact that we will be submitting some names for the eldership. And something that comes to mind, a verse that comes to mind in reference to that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul tells the brethren there, test all things. And certainly, if there's anything worth testing, it's the one who will be our future shepherd of this congregation to make sure that they are sound and qualified. Uh, and, and so, brethren, let's not be afraid to, to test uh, one another. Let's not be afraid to be tested as in asking questions, interviewing them, trying to uh, get to the bottom of the truth because that's all we want. We just want the same thing, and that is scriptural uh, elders to lead us as shepherds. You know, we as humans are not perfect by any means. In fact, James mentions in James chapter 3 and verse 2 that we all stumble in many things. And how true that is. And of course, James is referring to unrighteousness, to sin. But we can also apply those words to everyday things, general things. We're not perfect in everyday things. Uh, for example, sometimes we get tongue-tied, we stutter. Our mouths don't work like they need to. Sometimes our legs don't work like they need to. We trip over ourselves. It happens from time to time. Uh, sometimes, and I got this from observing both my dad and Mr. Ken Hope, sometimes our knees don't work like they used to. And when we get down, we can't get back up. And, you know, I've heard them both tell me that one day I'm going to be there. That's true, but I'm not there yet, so I'm going to enjoy these knees while I still have them. And sometimes we don't remember what we need to remember and how true that is. Sometimes our memories do fail us from time to time. Sometimes we forget little things where we put our keys, our phone, our wallet. Sometimes we forget big things like, you know, birthdays, uh, perhaps uh, holidays, and perhaps husbands can relate to this one, anniversaries. It happens from time to time. But, you know, if we want to remember something, we will remember it because we made a point to remember. If we want to remember something, we will remember it because we made a point to remember. And, you know, for those anniversaries, for whatever event that we need to remember, perhaps we'll write them down on our calendar. Perhaps we'll make a note beside our bed or, or put it on our mirror or our dresser, wherever we'll see it next. So that way we are reminded that way we think about it so that we don't forget it. In fact, a good example of this we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. We read here how God tells His people to put His commandments in their hearts. And then He goes on to tell them how they can put His commandments in their hearts. And of course, we're talking about uh, our minds, our thoughts, what we think about constantly. And God tells them how they can do that. Notice with me what Deuteronomy 6 verses 7 through 9 says. The Bible says, God says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Again, God is telling them how they can put these commandments in their hearts by making a point to remember. And if you're going to talk about them constantly, if you're going to teach them to your children diligently, you're not going to forget them. In fact, he says here, bind them as a sign on your hand. Use your hands constantly. And you're going to notice that there's something on your hand. Bind them as a, a frontless between your eyes. You're going to notice that there's something between your eyes. He says, write them on the doorposts of your house when you leave your house and on the, on the gates when you leave your property. At all points in time, remember my words, remember my commandments. We can remember something if we make it a point to remember. In fact... In the Old Testament, there were times where God established memorials to help His people remember and think about important events. You can remember with me in Genesis chapter 9, the rainbow. Remember we see there that God had flooded the earth and God made a sign of the covenant or a sign of this promise that He would never again flood the earth. He would never again destroy the earth by flooding. 
And so that rainbow, the bow that he set in the sky, was that memorial, a reminder of that promise, of that covenant that he made with the earth. Another one, remember in Joshua 3 and 4, we read there about the stone memorial for crossing the Jordan River. God, through Joshua, told the Israelites that a great, uh, a great event was about to take place. And we see that that is exactly what happened. You see, the Levites, they bore the ark, and as soon as their feet touched the waters of the Jordan, the waters backed up, they piled up, and they walked across on dry ground. And God said, I want you to know that I'm with you, Joshua, as I was with Moses. And so they instructed the leaders of the Israelites, uh, one man from each tribe, 12 tribes, to get 12 stones, and they made a memorial to remember that event. You can also notice another familiar one, the Passover, in Exodus chapter 12. This was a feast established for the Israelites to remember God's rescuing them from Egypt. Remember, that was the last and final plague. Uh, Pharaoh had hardened his heart up until that point, but we see here that he finally let them go because of God's mighty power. And those with the blood on the doorpost, he passed over them, and they ate a meal in, in remembrance of that. And so, again, these are some memorials that were used in order to help the, those in Old Testament times, even some today, the rainbow we can remember today, as memorials to help us remember, to remind us of important events. And likewise, in New Testament times, God has established a memorial for us to remember and to thank on. And that is, of course, the Lord's Supper. Every Sunday we come and we meet and we eat the bread, we drink the fruit of the vine, and we think about something that should never be forgotten. And that is, of course, the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ, God's beloved Son. And so tonight I want us to, for a moment, think about what to think about, really. We're talking about tonight what to think about concerning the bread. Now this is going to be a two-part lesson. Uh, tonight we're going to talk specifically about the bread. And then the next time I preach, which will be a little bit later in this month, we're, we'll talk about what to think about the fruit of the vine. Now for those of us who have been Christians for a long time, uh, we're not going to mention a lot of things that you probably don't already know. And so really take this as a reminder, as a refresher, as we think about the importance of the Lord's Supper. But really this lesson is for those of us who are perhaps new converts. I know of at least one. But those of us who perhaps haven't heard a, a lesson about this, maybe we know a little bit about what to do, but perhaps I can help, perhaps we can look to the Scriptures and notice what exactly we are to think about when we think of the Lord's Supper when we ponder those events, that memorial of Jesus dying for us. And so uh, tonight our uh, plan is going to be very simple. We're going to look simply at the establishment of the Lord's Supper, the fact that we must uh, partake of it, the fact that it is very important. We're going to talk specifically about the bread and what it represents, and then we'll go into the details of what that represents as to, as to what we should think about. Now, just for a moment, I'd like us to briefly look at a couple reasons why the Lord's Supper is so important. There are a multitude of reasons, a myriad of reasons why the Lord's Supper, why that event that we think about is so important. But here's just a few reasons that we could briefly mention for tonight. One reason why the Lord's Supper is so important is because this event that we are to remember, Christ's death, it marks man's redemption and forgiveness. You know, ever since man sinned in the garden, ever since sin into the world, God has been on a course full speed ahead to bring us to Christ. We know, of course, the Old Testament, it was there to bring us to Christ, as Galatians 3 tells us. But we know that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, Hebrews 10 and verse 4. It was Christ that could do that. It was His blood. And so ever since that day that man sinned, ever since sin entered the world, God has been trying to bring us to His precious, perfect Son, who would be able to redeem us and forgive us. Another reason why the Lord's Supper is important is because, number two, this event demonstrates the depths of God's love. When Jesus died on the cross for us, we see just how far He was willing to go, how far God was willing to go, how far Christ was willing to go to bring us to that salvation. Of course, we didn't deserve it. Romans chapter 5 and uh, verse 8 tells us that we were the enemies of Christ, really, because we sinned. But yet He made peace through the blood of Christ, and we were brought near to Him. We were redeemed. And so the event that we think about, the Lord's Supper, it demonstrates the depths of God's love. Just how far He was willing to go 
to bring us into forgiveness, to bring us back to a relationship with Him, not even sparing His only Son. And of course, a third reason why the Lord's Supper is important is because it's commanded. If it wasn't commanded, then perhaps it wouldn't be as important, but it is important. That's why God commanded us to observe it. And that should emphasize in our minds the importance of this occasion. The fact that God wants us to take time every single Sunday to think about what His Son did for us. And so tonight, let's look first of all at the establishment of the Lord's Supper. The fact that it was established, the fact that we must observe it. I'd like us to look to a few gospel accounts, including what Paul says. You know, we can mention Matthew chapter 26. And I'll go ahead and read this for you. Uh, for time's sake, but Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28, we read there of the Lord's Supper's establishment. The Bible says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, we can also mention Mark 14, 22 through 24, but we're not going to read it because it says nearly identical, the exact same thing as Matthew says. Their accounts are very similar uh, in this instant. However, we can look to Luke chapter 22. Luke is a little bit more detailed in his account, and he says some things that are, of course, still the same, but he just used, uses different words. Notice with me here the institution, the establishment of the Lord's Supper, Luke 22. Let's read together simply verses 19 and 20. Luke 22, 19 and 20. The Bible says, And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many. So again, Jesus established the Lord's Supper to remember him. Let's also notice the account of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. We read this one often, and this one also goes into a little bit more detail as to what was said on that night. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's notice together verses 23 through 25. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. The Bible says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So again, we see here four times that the Lord's Supper is referenced. Four times emphasizing the importance of it. And every time we see it established, we see what those emblems represent. Specifically tonight, we're looking at the bread. And the reason why we went through all those is because we see uh, the details as to what each author says, as to what each inspired author mentions concerning that bread. Some are more clear than others, some are more vague, but we want to notice here what that bread represents. Notice with me, in Matthew, as we already mentioned, chapter 26, he says concerning the bread, this is my body. Luke says the same thing in chapter 14, this is my body. Okay, so that's what the bread represents, my body. But what about his body are we to think about when we do take of that bread? Well, Luke and Paul go into a little bit more detail. Luke, in chapter 22, he says, this is my body which is given for you. We're to think about the fact that his body was a sacrifice, that it was prepared for us to be offered for us. Paul also goes into more detail. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, this is my body which is broken for you. We're to think about the suffering of that sacrifice, the pain, the torture, if you will, that our Lord endured in those hours of his crucifixion. And so, again, we see here the establishment. We see what the bread represents. It represents His body. We're to think about the fact that it was given and that it was broken all for us. Now, let's notice the details of that sacrifice. We understand what it represents, but let's look at the details of what we can thoroughly think about when we do partake of that bread. Again, His body was given for us. 
I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. We read here how his body was prepared for that very reason, to be our sacrifice. Again, Hebrews chapter 10. I'd like you to notice with me verses 5 through 10. Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. Actually, let's just look at verses 5 through 7 and then verse 10. Notice with me here. The Bible says, Therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, and the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And so again, we see here that fact that His body was prepared for us. It was given for us. That's the main reason why Jesus came to earth. Now, He came for several reasons, to seek and save the lost, to teach us. But the main reason He came was to offer up His body as a sacrifice for us. And can you imagine if God's only will for your life was just to die a horrendous death? Yet that's the plan that God had for Christ, to die for us, to suffer for us even. And so what we can take from this passage in Hebrews chapter 10, the fact that it was prepared, that it was given for us, is that His death was no accident. Jesus didn't die just because the Jews conspired against Him. But remember, Jesus says in John 10 and verse 18, I lay my life down of myself. I give my life willingly. No one takes it from me. Jesus had a plan. This was the plan all along. This wasn't some martyr or death of a wise teacher. This was all a part of a plan. This was why He came to, of course, give Himself as a sacrifice for us. He was foreordained, as Peter tells us. This was purposeful. This was prepared. And so when we take that bread, when we eat of it, we should think about that fact that His body was prepared for that very reason of suffering terribly for us. Now, that's what Luke mentions, the body that was given for us. But Paul also mentions the body that was broken for us. His body went through much suffering. I appreciate Mr. Tickner reading Isaiah 53. I'd like us to turn there again, if you would. We're not going to read all this, but we can mention some things. There are some very interesting things that Isaiah mentions here in his prophecies, a very detailed prophecy. Notice with me here, uh, Isaiah 53. You know, when we think about the sufferings of Christ, oftentimes we really only focus on the physical pain that He suffered. But Jesus also went through mental and emotional anguish as well. And Isaiah, I believe, hits on that. Notice with me what we read in Isaiah 53 and verse 3. The Bible says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised, and we did not esteem Him. Verse 4, Surely He has borne our sorrows, er, excuse me, He's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We see here, of course, Jesus suffered more than just that physical pain. He also endured that, that mental and emotional pain. He was rejected even by His own people whom He loved. In fact, in the book of Matthew, Jesus utters at one point in time, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I want to have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks under hers. We see there the compassion, the love, the loving kindness, the mercy that He has for His people, but yet we see ultimately He was rejected, He was despised. That's not an easy thing to take, an easy thing to handle, but yet we see our Lord was despised by His own people. He was rejected by nearly everyone or at least the religious leaders. And so, again, we see that these people whom he loved, they were the ones who eventually mocked him, ridiculed him, and made him suffer more than just physically. And of course, Jesus suffered physically as well. That is, of course, what we typically think about, what we should think about. He suffered a horrendous death, torture, basically. In fact, Isaiah goes into detail about that as well. Notice with me Isaiah 53 and verse 5. The Bible says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. You know, if the emotional scars of rejection wasn't enough, they added 
injury to insult. They, of course, treated him with, with contempt. They treated him in a way that was humiliating. In fact, I'd like us to look to a couple of accounts, just, just a couple. Uh, we see both of these in the book of Matthew. If you would, look with me in your Bibles to Matthew. I'd like you to notice with me chapter 26, verses 67 and 68. This is the account of Jesus standing before the trial of the Sanhedrin. Again, Matthew chapter 26. And let's notice together verses 67 and 68. Now, we're by no means going to mention all of the sufferings that Jesus went through, but we can at least mention a few, and these are, are not good. They're, they're brutal, but yet we see what our Lord went through on our behalf. Again, Matthew 26, starting at verse 67, the Bible says, Then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? And I do believe we see in both of these instances, both the physical and the mental anguish. Not only did they beat him, but we also see that he was spat upon, and as well he was mocked. Both the physical and the emotional pain that our Lord endured through that body that was prepared for us. We can also make mention of Matthew 27, verses 27 through 31, just one chapter over. This is when Jesus was in the Praetorium, which is the governor's headquarters, and he was surrounded by the entire garrison, or cohort, as it says, uh, by the, as, as it seems, all the guards at the headquarters there. And we see that they did not treat him very nicely at all. Notice with me what we read here. Again, Matthew 27, verses 27 through 31. The Bible says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Again, we see here that they, they humiliated him, really. They stripped his clothes off of him. We don't know if he was completely naked or near it, but imagine they treated him like a, like a, a plaything. They put their own clothes on him, and they mocked him. They spat on him. And that reed that they made into a, a, a staff or a, a royal staff, if you will, they beat him on the head with it. They put a crown of thorns on his head. This is what our Lord went through for us. We see here both emotional and physical pain that our Lord endured on our behalf. And this isn't even all, of course. Of course, we see that right after these events, we see the crucifixion. After all this and more, it was then that Jesus was finally crucified. And of course, we know what the crucifixion consisted of. His body was nailed to a cross while He was still alive, hands and feet. His body hung there for hours until he finally drew his last breath. That, my friends, is what the Lord's Supper is all about. It's thinking about that sacrifice, about that event that we should never, at any point in time, ever forget. Now, luckily for us, the story doesn't end there. We know, of course, the story ends triumphantly. Our Lord raises from the dead, and He is now at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for us. And that is truly an amazing thing. But when we think about the Lord's Supper, we're not thinking about the triumphant part of it. We're thinking about the fact that He suffered for us. We're thinking about the depths of that love, of that loving kindness, that He would even think about giving His life for us. So these are the things that our Lord went through. These are the things that He suffered. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, when we take the bread specifically, we should think about these things. The fact that His body was prepared for us. This was no accident. This was no death of some wise teacher. This was all a part of the plan to give His life for us. And of course, we need to think about the fact that His body was broken for us. He went through so much pain and, and of course, emotional and mental pain as well. He did all that on our behalf. And so, this might be some things that perhaps we... Some of us know, those of us who've been in the church for a while, we've, we've done these things. We do these things constantly. But it's good to go back to the basics every now and then. It's good to be reminded 
But again, this lesson was primarily for those of us who are perhaps new to the body of Christ, at least for some amount of time. I hope that this helps. I hope that this perhaps will help us think of that all-important event of what our Lord did for us on that day. That day that changed history. The day that we now have access to God. That we can now spend an eternity with our God. Of course, all that we have access through the blood of Christ, through His sacrifice. And so, to extend the invitation now, we want to, of course, plead with you. If there's anyone here who is not a Christian, we plead you to do so. God has done so much on our behalf. He's given us everything He could possibly give us in order to come to Him. But we have to also make the steps to come to Him as well. If we draw near to Him, He will draw near to us. Of course, as we read in the book of James. And so we can do so by, of course, believing in Him and repenting of our sins, turning from them. Of course, confessing that He is our Lord, being baptized into Christ, or remaining faithful to Him. And of course, maintaining that faithfulness until our death, as Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us. If there are any here who are Christians and have not been faithful as we should, we plead that you will come back. If you need prayers of any kind, please let it be known as we stand and as we sing.